Hello, everyone, and a big welcome to all the kids, parents, classes, science, and nature lovers out there. Thanks so much for joining the Ontario Science Centre today for our chat about the great outdoors. My name is Laura Murray from the Ontario Science Centre, and I studied wildlife biology and ecology, and I love talking about and exploring the great outdoors in all seasons. But I'm pretty excited to welcome our special guest today from Science North in Sudbury. Hello, Megan. Hi, Laura. How are you? I'm doing really well. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm here in the Science Center in Sudbury. Um, I'm going to take my mask off now, though, just so that everyone can hear me a little bit better. So my colleagues who are doing animal care with me today are going to stay back from me. <laughs> so. It's a pleasure to be here and I'm super excited. Um, a little bit about my background is that I uh, studied zoology and have been doing animal care and education when it comes to our animals and ecosystems across Canada for the past about 15 years. And so it's definitely one of my passions and I'm excited to talk about it with you today. Well, we're so glad you can join us. We've done a few of these uh, chats with Science North and it's really great to be able to compare. You're about 400 kilometers north of us, so a different part of the province. So it's nice to be able to have those chats. Um, I'm gonna begin with our land acknowledgement. So welcome to the audience watching from across Ontario and beyond on land that has been inhabited by indigenous peoples for millennia. The name for our province, Ontario, came from an Iroquois word meaning sparkling water or beautiful lake. And that seems very fitting to honor our province's 250,000 beautiful sparkling lakes. I am a settler descended from five generations of Welsh, Scottish and English immigrants and settlers and acknowledge that Toronto, the land I live and work on, is the ancestral territory of the Anishinaabeg Nation and includes the Haudenosaunee, the Huron Wendat, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit. Toronto is governed by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant and the Toronto Purchase Treaty signed with the Mississaugas of the New Credit and the Williams Treaty signed with the Chippewa Nation. Toronto is now also home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Metis people from across Turtle Island. I am thankful for the careful stewardship of the land and water by indigenous people past and present who honor nature's rhythms. The, the warmth of the sun, extra hours of daylight and ample rainfall mark the beginning of summer's growth and renewal. Caring for the land, all people and all life that depend on it is a shared responsibility and begins with connecting to and respecting nature. I also want to acknowledge the recent discovery of the unmarked remains of 215 Indigenous children at the former Kamloops Indian Residential School, and that that has sent a wave of grief and shock across the country. Rooted in racism, the harm and atrocities inflicted on Indigenous peoples through colonial policies and institutions like residential schools continues today. We must act on reconciliation and every child matters. Thank you. Over to you, Megan. Thank you, Laura. That was a wonderful acknowledgement. Um, I would like to acknowledge that here at Science North, I am on the traditional and ancestral lands of the Atikamekshing Anishinaabe and Wanapate First Nation. I would also like to acknowledge the Métis Nation for their cultural and economic contributions in this area. Uh, these lands sit in the Robinson-Huron Treaty area, and it is important for all of us to remember that we were all treaty people. Thanks, Megan. Um, and we're going we're gonna to start our chat today, and we're going to actually talk about, we've, I've mentioned the four seasons, and Ontario, I have to say, is a great province for exploring in any season. Megan, can you just remind us why we do have four seasons? Absolutely, for sure. So seasons happen because I got to get my trusty globe over here. Nice. Um, so I'm going to back up a little bit. <laughs> so as you can see, the seasons happen here in Canada and other places in the world too um, because of the Earth's axis. So you see the Earth is sort of like at this 23 degree axis on its side. So as we sort of travel around the sun, and that takes a full year, right, to get around the sun, 
um, as we sort of like move either facing away or facing towards the sun on this trajectory means that the sun is either going to be hitting North America directly or it's going to be hitting it on a really big angle. And the more direct we are facing the sun, the that's when we're going to get our summer and we're going to warm up into spring. But then as we move away going around the sun, uh, we're going to have less direct sunlight and that's when we're going to get into the fall and winter seasons and it's really cool too because there are seasons in, in other places of the world too but it's really dependent on where that you are near the equator so up here in canada we're pretty far away from the equator so the equator is this blue line here so we have relatively short summers or shorter compared to somebody who might be living in the United States or even closer to the equator. So that's why we have seasons. And I don't know about you, Laura, but I'm very grateful for the seasons that we do have here in Canada. I agree. I say lucky us for four seasons. And really, just as you said, it kind of all starts with the sun, right? And plants are harnessing this incredible, powerful energy from the sun. And that fuels this explosion of growth, plenty of food and all kinds of new life in nature. And basically every life form takes advantage of this summer season, insects, birds, turtles, all of it. And it's all about feeding and breeding. Now there's a lot of things I'm looking forward to with the change in the weather. One of them is going canoeing. Um, I love paddling. Um, I love birding, swimming in lakes, stargazing, being out in all kinds of different ecosystems. Megan, how will you be exploring the great outdoors this summer? So like you, I enjoy paddling too, but more in a kayak rather than a canoe. I'm not very good at steering the, the canoe personally. <laughs> um, but I'm also a big fan of camping. So hopefully we can get some camping in the summer and uh, definitely some hiking. I'm also a big fan of just sitting out in the sun and reading a good book. So <laughs> I, I Two thumbs up on all that. That all sounds great to me. And so many ecosystems to explore and so little time. Now, ecosystems, they're kind of like this connected web of life that is also linked to their environment. And it's things like how much rain, how much sun, um, what sort of wind, what the soil is like, what are the rocks like, what's the geography like. And where you are in Sudbury is very different than where we are in Southern Ontario. And there's all kinds of different ecosystems. Um, and if you have some ideas of types of ecosystems, you can put them in the chat. You know, forest is a type of ecosystem. Grasslands is a type of, e type of ecosystem. Coral reefs, you know, those are all types of ecosystems, but it turns out Megan and I share a favorite ecosystem and that is wetlands, yes. hooray for wetlands. Megan, can you tell us a little bit more about what wetlands are and why they're important? So I guess the easiest description of a wetland is very simply land area that is wet or has water in it, not necessarily a lake or a river. So they're a little bit different and they do house one of the most richest biodiversities on our planet. Regardless of where you are, bi uh, wetlands are very, very important for biodiversity and the number of plants and animals, including insects, mosses, um, different algae. These are all really are all very specific to different types of wetlands as well, because there's four different types of wetlands, uh, main types of wetlands, I should say, and. Some of the reasons why they're so important is because they act as natural protection against drought because they hold so much water. Um, also, they are natural filters, so they, they filter out a lot of um, chemicals and other types of organic things out of the water to make it a little bit more fresh, a little bit more uh, potable for us, but also for animals and plants that live there. Um, and, uh, and yeah, they, they're definitely one of my favorite ecosystems to explore in the summertime. Me too. And you mentioned the idea of animals using them, right? Wildlife habitat, wetlands are, might be at the top of the list for wildlife habitat really around the world. Um, certainly here in Ontario, they're very, very important. They're huge nursery areas for things like fish and frogs and insects and birds, all kinds of animals 
um, nest or, or uh, build a family in wetlands. So lots of important reasons. You also mentioned the, um, the, the hanging on to water thing. And here in Southern Ontario, we're in the middle of a drought. Right. We've had, we had a mild winter and a pretty dry spring. And, you know, wetlands, well, the wetlands have to exist to hang on to the water and the water has to fall first. And so we're in a bit of a drought. And, um, but they can help to manage some of those things. Just as you said, unfortunately here in Southern Ontario, we've lost about 70% of our wetlands. Now, as you said, there's four different types marshes um which are mostly there's more open water they're really productive really rich in biodiversity as you said um there's also swamps which have a lot of trees there's fens and there's bogs and here's a picture here um on the left you can see what is a pretty typical marsh some open water some lily pads floating um some stuff coming out of the water and on the right you see a close-up of the picture uh, of one of the plants. And this is cattail. Um, this is that when Megan mentioned the idea of filtering the water, cattails are the ones that do it. They are the superstars of this. Um, you can see the seed head on the top there, the brownish thing that kind of looks like a hot dog on a stick. Um, and um, that creates these fluffy seeds. It's used for nesting material. The leaves, of course, are photosynthesizing, so they're releasing oxygen. They're cleaning the water as well. Um, lots of birds nesting cattail marshes, things like red-winged blackbirds. So lots of, lots of important things tied just to the cattails. That's just the cattail part. Um, and uh, lots of things can hide in those. So I'm gonna paint a little bit of a picture of a marsh and imagine you're approaching a march a marsh from a distance and uh, we're going to take a look right from the sky right down to into the water as you approach you hear the sound of red-winged blackbirds and frogs calling from those lily pads there an osprey is flying high overhead looking for fish swallows are chasing mosquitoes over the open water and they're good at it which is a good thing um, a mother moose is, and her calf are munching plants in the shallows. A heron is hiding in those cattails, waiting for a crayfish. Dragonflies are skimming the surface of the water, looking for newly emerged uh, mosquitoes. Um, so lots of things are going on above the water, right on the water. Water striders are skating right on the surface with that boundary between air and water. Below the water, Turtles are feeding on underwater plants and algae. A sunfish is scraping out a nest to lay her eggs. A snapping turtle is resting in the mud and the water is just teeming with tiny plankton and insect larvae and bits of plants and worms and tadpoles and all kinds of things. And supporting it all at the base of every food chain is plants that are harnessing that energy from the sun and uh, creating food, but most importantly, oxygen. Um, and if you've got other ideas of what you might see in a wetland, you can please put them in the chat. Um, and the next slide we have is one of my favorite animals and um, favorite birds. I am a bird watcher. This is called a Canada warbler, a very handsome warbler, all very classy, wearing his necklace and his yellow spectacles, yellow glasses. This is a long distance migrant. So these guys, like all warblers, are insect eaters. They're specialist insectivores. Not a lot of insects in Ontario in February. So they have to go south for the winter. And these ones are champions. 6,000 kilometers, they travel all the way to South America, um, to Peru a lot of the time which is kind of like flying from Toronto to Europe. So that is a huge migration, a lot of air miles they put on. And all along the way, they got to find food to eat. They're insect eaters. Guess where they stop? They stop at a lot of wetlands, places that are close to, close to water, thickets and tangles. They like all that kind of stuff. Um, and these are called staging areas. So they don't spend the winter there. They don't spend the summer there but they're spending time in these sorts of wetlands all along the way. And because these wetlands are disappearing, these birds are threatened. They're losing their habitat. They're losing their areas to stay. Now, Megan, we mentioned some different types of wetlands. So I think you're gonna talk about uh, another type. Yes, absolutely. And actually there's a question here um, about how do they hold so much water? and 
one of the reasons is especially uh, why, like what why this next wetland is my favorite. So my favorite wetland, and certainly one that we see a lot of up here in Northern Ontario is bogs. And yes, there we go. And bogs are super cool because they're very unlike other types of wetlands they don't get water from like underground sources or rivers or lakes they get their water just from precipitation so from rainfall or snowfall in the winter time so very very special but because of that they're also very low in nutrients and the biggest thing that you'll the most biomass that you'll find in a bog is this uh is peat moss or peat and that is one of the reasons why like some wetlands hold so much water it's because of this these mosses and in it they're really just like a sponge and, and peat itself is very similar it's basically just like half decomposed plant matter um, and some bogs are thousands and thousands of years old because they decompose so slowly because there's not that much oxygen, there's not much nutrients going in and out of it. The water and the, 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 the water itself and the environment is very acidic. And so it really means that the plants and the animals that live in that environment have to be super adapted to that environment. And that's, that's one of the, the coolest things about, about bogs. And some of the animals or plants that are really specific to bogs are things like black spruce, really short, short trees. Um, and you won't see a lot of tall things growing. Everything will be sort of short, close to the ground. And you'll get all these mosses, like, like I mentioned before, and the peat, um, and carnivorous plants. So carnivorous plants don't get their energy from the sun or not all their energy from the sun like other plants do they get it from eating other living things like small insects and sometimes larger things so uh like amphibians or um even larger insects like dragonflies and things like that so it's really really neat and actually um I just found out from Laura that it is actually the, uh, it's World Peatlands Day today. Is that correct, Laura? Yeah, I love it. So peatlands, it's more of a British term, I think, but it's basically bogs. So it's yeah. World Bog Day. So like how appropriate. And bogs are amazing ecosystems. Quite a different type of wetland, but crucially important as well. So that's just, that's just one of those nice accidents that it happened to be today. Yeah. Um, and what's really cool is this idea that wetlands, they're kind of they're the best of both worlds, right? They're land, they're water, they're, it's, it's kind of all coming together. And um, there's a group of animals, we've actually mentioned them a couple of times already, that um, kind of embody this idea of wetlands and they sort of have a webbed toe in each of these two different types of habitats. So we're going to play a little game. Um, that is called Name That Amphibian, which is really cool. And so I hope everyone's ready. And what's neat is that amphibians call in the spring, the males call to attract a mate. And they do this from water. Um, and they all have unique sorts of calls. So we're gonna, we're gonna show a picture, we're gonna play the call. And if you have some guesses about what amphibian it is, they're all from Ontario, I'll tell you that. Um, you can put it in the chat. And uh, so I think we're ready. Name I love, I love, these, love guys. these guys. These guys, these guys are, so are so great. great. Oh, I oh, think I we think may we be getting, getting an, an echo. echo. I'm not, I'm not sure, sure about that. that. Um, and they, and they, they especially, especially have, have one toe, toe on land and water. And water. So, so if you know, know who this is, is um, Megan, any, any answers, answers coming, coming up in the, in the chat, chat there? there? Yes, yes, there, there are, are a couple. couple. Everyone, Everyone there's, there's, there's some bull frog guesses. There's a couple of other frogs. Wolf frogs. 
never yeah, heard of that dog, dog, but there, there are, are people, people who are saying toad. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. right. This is the American, American toad, toad, as it's, as it's called. called. And, and here's, here's a fun, a fun fact, fact for you. A group of toads is called a knot. That's the collective name for a group of toads. And they are champion mosquito munchers. Um, and, um, and early, early breeders. breeders. So, so already, already these, these guys, guys have done their calling and toadlets, tiny little toadlets will be leaving the ponds and heading into the forest because these, these guys, guys only go to water for, um, for breeding. So I think, so I think we're, we're ready, ready for the, for the next, next frog, frog or amphibian. amphibian. Love, love these, these ones. ones. Love, love it. it. Uh, let's see. We have we a couple of bullfrog, bullfrog guesses, guesses again. again. Bullfrog seems to be very, very popular. popular. <laughs> this, this one, one is a bit of a clue, clue as, as to what it's, it's resting, resting on. on. Yes. 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 Oh, there we go. I see I some great frog. frog. Yeah. yeah. That's, That's awesome. awesome. So, so great tree frogs, frogs are really neat because they are a tree, tree, tree frog, frog, which means that they live high, high up in the trees, trees usually, usually in, in areas with still, still constant water, water them. And, and they have toe pads that are sticky, sticky. And, you and you can see them in the in photo there, there, which is really great. great. And the coolest thing about tree frogs, I think, is that they change color. So, so we have, have a tree, tree frog, frog here at Science North, North. And, and some days, especially in the summertime, summertime when it's nice and warm, warm he'll, he'll actually be a bright green, which is very, very cool. cool. So, so depending, depending on their, their energy, energy levels or where they are on the tree and maybe how much a little bit more, more they'll actually change colors, color, which is very, very cool. cool. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're amazing, amazing with camouflage. With camouflage. Like, like they, they can, can look, look like a bird poo or a hunk of lichen or anything. I have actually never, never seen, seen one. one. They're, they're such good at camouflage. camouflage. Okay, okay, I think I we're think ready, ready for the, for the next, next uh, yes. screaming amphibian. amphibian. Yeah, yeah, these ones are these great, great and um, pretty, pretty common, common across, across the province. The they, they actually take two, two years, years right, right from the time they breed and lay their eggs to when you get adult, adult frogs. frogs. Any answers, Any answers uh, coming up, Megan? Megan? There's, There's a few, few again, again, lots of bullfrog, bullfrog guesses. Got, got some toads. Close, it's close to the bullfrog. It's a little tricky to play. Yeah, these are green frogs. And they're, and they're actually, actually they're, they're, they're more of a sort, sort of olive green. green. Yes. yes. Uh, but they're a they're good, good one. one. And, and I, I think, think we've got, we've got one, one more singing amphibian. amphibian. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I love it. Oh, oh some of these been giving the scientific, scientific names of some of the animals. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice. Oh, we've oh, got lots of good, good people, good identifiers in here. They're, they're saying leopard, leopard frog. frog. Yep, that's, yep, the, that's one. the one. That's, that's it. it. Yeah. yeah, and this is absolutely one of the most common types of frog that will be. And then the thing about leopard frogs, too, is that they'll actually, um, sorry, they'll actually be found quite far away from water sometimes in, in grasslands, which is kind of neat. And something that's kind of interesting too is that whereas here in Ontario, even like Southern Ontario, Northern Ontario, 
they're quite common, but in Western Canada, like out in Alberta and British Columbia, they're actually considered species at risk and some of, and they're actually an endangered species. So it's very interesting. Yeah, I mean, frogs and toads of all kinds can be at risk because they have this um, web toe in both worlds and because they breathe through their skin, right? So they can be impacted by air pollution, by water pollution, by toxins on land. They, it, so they're actually a good indicator of ecosystem health in that way. Um, but it's always great to hear them. And many of these frogs and toads actually sing into the summer, like bullfrogs. I know bullfrogs were popular in the chat. Uh, and green frogs, they sing well into the summer and they all have quite distinctive sounds. So that's something to look for. What they do have in common is that they all eat insects. And uh, we talked about wetlands as being a nursery area for nursery for, you know, lots of different critters, but that includes insects. Now, not many people are really that fond of insects, especially the biting insects at this time of year. Um, the mosquitoes are coming out, the black flies, but they're a crucial part of any food chain. I think any food chain across the world insects are a really important part and we need all these insects to keep our ecosystems healthy um, and frogs are a great indication of that if you have any ideas of what other uh, animals are insectivores you can put that in the chat and these are there's many beneficial insects as well um, Megan do, do you know are you familiar with any beneficial insects Oh, my favorite. <laughs> so I'm a beekeeper, but I also am super passionate about our native pollinators as well. And so bumblebees are probably one of the top ones for me, but of course butterflies, even wasps, wasps and flies are really important pollinators as well. And there are so many different types of bees. There are leaf cutter bees and sweat bees, um, of course honey bees, uh, but then bumblebees are definitely a uh, under thought of, I feel like. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of animal underdogs that needs a little, yeah. uh, need a little love. And what's really cool is that there are, there are lots of animals that take advantage of kind of when insects are most active. And they, there's a special name associated with that. So I think we've got a slide for this one. Yes. And actually, uh, just quickly here, um, because we're talking about insects, somebody actually asked Laura, what insects do the warblers eat? Well, they eat pretty much anything. A lot of mosquitoes and midges and black flies. Um, you know, mosquitoes uh, breed in still water, like in lakes and ponds and stuff like that. And uh, then all those adults emerge and they're just starting to do that. So it's a hugely important food supply for warblers. Uh, and things like swallows and swifts and nighthawks and bats and all kinds of animals are eating, are, are really surviving on that, on insects for the bulk of their diet. Um, right. But mosquitoes would make up a big part of it. Caterpillars, beetles, spiders, like you kind of name it, they'll, they'll eat most. They're not picky. <laughs> no. And it's all good protein. I think there are some suggestions in the chat too about some other underrated bugs, which are also spiders and dragonflies. And I think in relation to other pollinators, somebody also mentioned bats as well, which is really great. Massive, yeah, bats are one of my favorites. And yeah. dragonflies are supreme predators. So mm -hmm. dragonflies, dragonflies are great. great. And so and these so animals, animals that are active at, at um, dawn and dusk are known dust. as crepuscular animals. Um, you may have heard of animals that are nocturnal or animals that are diurnal, active during the day. Nocturnal means night. Crepuscular means that kind of hour before sunrise and the hour after sunset. And this is a really important time uh, for many animals, not just insect eaters and insects, because the food is out there for sure, but things like um, prey animals like rabbits and deer, um, you know, the light isn't as good. They can hide from predators a little bit more easily. Um, and so there's there's a lot of animals that are active then. Moose tend to be active then. It's not as hot during the day. And I have to say, I have a lot of favorites that are crepuscular animals. Yes. One of my absolute favorites is fireflies. And June is the month in Ontario to look for fireflies. They're a type of beetle, so another insect. Um, 
and they they create the males are trying to attract a mate they have they create light basically they create light in their bum like how amazing is that yep. um it's magical and they're trying to attract a female the females are hanging out in the leaf litter and the leftovers of leaves from last year what another reason not to clean out your leaf leaf uh litter and your brush and stuff like that um and so they're they're a great animal to look for at this time of year um and we've mentioned some other ones bats are one of my absolute favorites skunk lots of things are out at in in these crepuscular times and it's a latin word that basically means twilight uh megan any crepuscular animals up your way yeah for sure so moose is definitely a big one um they're more active at dawn and dusk and um of course you mentioned earlier skunks and then here at science north we also have um a beaver who likes to exhibit some crepuscular behavior as well so yeah beavers moose and then of course um black bears as well and i think in uh in a second we have a video of a nighttime or crepuscular vi visitor to my backyard. <laughs> so this is a black bear just walking right up onto my back deck. <laughs> and he likes to make an appearance right around about like 8.30 to between 10.30 is usually when he comes around. More so last summer, but this is just from a couple of weeks ago. So he definitely likes to come around and sniff around our compost bin and our um our our recycle bin as well so yeah he's definitely a really important one wow. to be aware of if you're out and about and exploring and enjoying nature especially here in northern ontario we always have to be very aware that we're in 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 black bear territory that's their that's their home wow. right? Yeah, that's um, that's quite the crepuscular animal, I have to say. That's quite a surprise, and I think it's a good reminder for all of us to be, uh, to be safe more in the outdoors, respect animals in their homes and their habitats. We've actually got a video from the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry about about bear wise being bear wise and being safe. Bears are shy and want to avoid humans, but they have an uncanny ability to sniff out easy food sources. They'll actually return to the same location the next time they get hungry. That's why relocating bears, even long distances, doesn't work. They will always remember where they found an easy meal. Don't let bears make your garbage their buffet. Keep it stored away until pickup day. Yeah, that's it. I think, you know, bears are expert sniffers, right? So the smells of garbage or barbecues or composters or all those things um, can bring them in. And this is a pretty lean time for bears. Mums are out with their cubs and bears are actually mostly vegetarian. So, you know, they're waiting for the berry crop, which hasn't come in yet. So um, we always have to remember to be to be aware, to be safe um and and really to leave no trace you mentioned camping and that's that's an important message certainly for anyone who's going camping yeah um it's also the time of year when lots of baby animals are are out and about they're exploring they're you know they're not as expert as their parents so be mindful when you're out and about um and those tiny toadlets are really hard to spot in the forest floor for sure yeah actually um, Somebody has a question here and it, and they're asking if it's scary when the bear comes into my backyard. And to answer you quickly, no, it's not scary. We have to be aware of it, but it's also important that I do my due diligence and not leaving my compost out or my, um, my uh, recycle bin or anything that the bear is going to want to get. So uh, right now I, I don't feed the birds anymore because they can find lots of food. So I have to do my due diligence. So no, I don't think it's scary, but I have to make sure that I'm also being aware that he's coming into my backyard because of where I live. So it's, we can coexist. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's it. It's all about being aware and uh, and being safe. And there's other ways that we need to be safe too, right? Um, we have we have new invasive species moving into the province. Things like ticks. So you want to make sure you're wearing your bug repellent and you're being safe around water and you've got your sunscreen and all those sorts of things. But there's lots of fun ways to explore when you're out. Um, out in the great outdoors of Ontario for sure. Um, best advice is to not touch anything when you're out there, especially those frogs that breathe through their skin. Imagine what you might have on your hands, hand sanitizer and sunscreen and bug repellent, all of those things are toxic to frogs. Um, so by all means, look at them and wonder at them and enjoy them, but best to leave them where they are. Now, um, Things are changing, of course, in the province. I mentioned that we're in a bit of a drought now. Um, and, you know, we're seeing the effects of climate change all the time. New invasive species are moving in, um, are moving north, all those sorts of things. What sort of impacts from climate change are you seeing around Sudbury? So I guess one of the biggest things that, um, especially since I've lived here the past nine years, that our winters are very unpredictable so whereas I'm used to seeing a lot of snow in the winter time for example whereas we didn't get a lot of snow this year so that really impacts the wetlands as we mentioned earlier because that's how they get some of their water or most of their water in some cases and the forests are a little bit drier so that can definitely impact forest fire season um, and of course if climate change is warming our northern temperatures which we have that which we see the data um, that can impact things like fish for example because fish need cold water to breed or they need a specific temperature in order to forage and, and hunt at and if the water is warming that means that they're going to have to forage deeper and in different uh, in deeper parts of the lake where it's cooler or different types of habitats altogether so those are the types of things that we're, we're seeing. And, and then of course, as I mentioned earlier with um, with bogs and the peat and the, and the muskegs that are further north than where, even where I am, they the, the water impacts the, those wetlands as well. Yeah, and they're important carbon sinks, right? Bogs mm -hmm. especially, they're, yeah. they're, they're helping to manage the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And if they dry out and start to die off, that is, that is really bad news. Yeah. Here in Southern Ontario, we're getting, things are out of sync. You know, the, the insects are emerging before the migratory birds are back and that's bad. Um, as I said, new animals are moving in and um, you know, so there's a, we've got a picture here. I surprised one of these on my back deck. It wasn't a bear, but last year I surprised one on my back deck. So we've got our, uh, our final slide here um, of a new animal that didn't exist in Ontario even 20 or 30 years ago. And if you know what animal this is, um, oh, I guess we've got it up there. It's not, a, this one isn't a quiz. Um, it's a Virginia opossum. And um, I was very surprised to see it in my backyard. And what's interesting is these are these are animals of the southern United States. They've slowly been moving north as the temperature warms. They don't hibernate, so they need relatively warm winters to survive, and they're doing that. Um, here's a fun fact: it's the only marsupial that is native to North America. So um, they give birth to live young, and and the young um, are raised in a in a pouch on the mom's tummy, just like a kangaroo or something. So. There's a curiosity for you that uh, we might not have been able to predict. Um, so I think we're just about out of time. We want to thank everyone. I love opossums. I love opossums too. I love all the, all the oddballs and underdogs, the skunks, the bats, all those sorts of things. Um, if we didn't get to all your questions, uh, we'll do our best to answer them uh, on Facebook in the, in the days to come. Um, we're so glad that everyone could join us today and by all means get out there and explore the explore the great outdoors of Ontario. There's a lot to see. Mm -hmm. Find out what critters live in your own neighborhood and what role they may play in the ecosystem. Um, and I mentioned that there's a collective noun for a group of toads called a knot. So get out there and find a gaggle of geese or a romp of otters. How about a flight of dragonflies or a fluffle of rabbits? Um, <laughs> lots of things to explore. Um, and, if you, and if you have any other questions, by all means, uh, add them. 
Uh, thanks so much for joining us, Megan. Thanks for your for your information and for the chat today. I hope um, I hope you stay safe around your your bear friend. And uh, in another two weeks, we'll have another live event on June the sixteenth. So we hope that you'll join us for that. Thanks, everyone, and uh, happy exploring. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Have a great day, and don't forget to come on to our onto our Science North stuff as well, and check us out on Facebook and YouTube and all that jazz. Yeah, you can find all our links um, in the chat and uh, 